good afternoon good morning uh, or good evening um uh, depends where are you joining we have a, a wide variety of people who are joining us today um, across the world so it, it, it's a different time zones we have we've tried to uh, put at a time where everybody can join in so hopefully it'll be reasonable although i do agree that for some people it might be too early in the morning and some people it might be too late in the evening uh, my name is hemant sharma i'm um i with gavin to keep it uh, convene uh, along with the fact Thank you very much i'm sorry if you lost hemant uh, but these these are a series of webinars, and you'll probably see the slide where we will uh, point you to uh, the future upcoming webinars. But we will start today. This is first of the series with um, guided growth. And my name is Om Lahoti. I'm from London. Uh, I work at King's College Hospital. So I'm going to talk about um, the basic science part of the growth plate. Uh, I'll go through the macro and micro structure. Uh, factors that control the behavior that's a very interesting area and um, you know how they respond to stress and how we can make use of those properties um, to the betterment of the, our patients I'll talk briefly about uh, pre-op planning I'm sure there will be some repetition from Mr. Uh, Durai Nayagam which is not a bad idea in these cases so you know we bring our own view on this and I'll touch upon reversibility and rebound issues after uh, guided growth and hopefully we'll show you some of the cases with that uh, in mind. So growth plate sits at the end of a long bone and it's a beautiful structure um, and it is generally parallel to the joint surface and nearly right angles to the weight bearing uh, um, axis of the limb. It is surrounded by a nice thick pericondral ring and it's very important to preserve it um, throughout our surgical procedures or surgical manipulation of the growth plate and there's also a little node uh, known as groove of Ranvier and that's where blood supply enters the more sensitive part of the growth plate. So in the middle of the slide you see this wonderful homogeneous uh, sort of columnar cellular structure and uh, the color changes from the top right to the bottom of the slides and we'll go through these layers. Although it's a homogeneous structure for description purposes, we divide this into five layers. Some people do six or some, some textbooks describe four to six, but they have a function in each layer. At the very top, just um, very close to the joint surface, there is a reserve zone. Here the cartilage cells are not multiplying, they are resting and ready to go. And it's a very sensitive area. You know, these are, if you want to call, stem cells of the growth plate. If they're damaged, then there won't be any further progression to the, to the other layers. And then they enter into a proliferative zone. They are metabolically very, very active. The cytoplasm increases in volume. The nucleus plumps up. And the whole matrix is a cartilage with a lot of co collagen fibers. So um, this is where they are beginning to now grow and transform into proliferative zone um, where the chondroblasts become chondrocytes. And then as we go down the ladder, there comes a point where the cartilage cells die naturally, an apoptosic process where they, uh, they die and giving rise to the bone formation. And there are lots of local chemical changes uh, dealing with uh, alkali phosphatase, calcium and phosphorus levels. And then it transits into the metaphyseal bone. So there are a couple of things we need to know about uh, the mechanical properties of these zones. So there are three layers, resting zone, zone of differentiation and zone of proliferation have a lot of matrix uh, in that and they are generally resistant to mechanical forces, particularly shear forces. The only time you can um, uh, really break it off is by twisting the, the top end of the bone. That's a torsion force. And as we go down the layers, the zone of hypertrophy and zone of provisional calcification are where are a weak link. There is no, not much matrix until they start to calcify beyond provisional calcification zone. So when we have a fracture, the line goes through this area. So it's a protective in a way. Salter had his type one and type two injuries. 
disrupt this zone of provisional calcification. But imagine the situation with um, uh, three and four, or a surgeon taking a drill to the topmost layer of the physis. Uh, that kills off um, um, the very sort of stem cell reserve of um, growth cartilage. So we know a very little about the biology of the growth plate. For example, you know, we all know that we are born with equal sex. Almost 99% of us um, you know, go through our adult life or throughout the growth with equal legs. We don't know what controls that left and right side equally. This is a factor which we, are, we know it exists, but we don't know what is exactly that control. So the systemic control affects both limbs um, uh, appropriately. And then there is an interesting factor. You saw this slide previously. It's the same structure at every physis, be it distal femur or proximal tibia. They have all those five zones and they transit from you know, resting zone to through the, through the proliferative zone to calcifying zone. But still, they behave differently. If you look at distal femur, it has a rapid growth. You know, it, it grows up to a centimeter per annum, whereas tibia 0.6 centimeters. So we don't know what controls this. You know, with the same structure, same uh, morphology or microbiology, they uh, the microscopic structure, they behave differently. We don't know what controls it. But it makes sense that there's something local to the distal femur or local to the proximal uh, tibia which controls it. And we, we, we don't know what they are, which is speculation. But we have a better understanding of mechanical behavior of this growth plate. So um, this is where this white uh, Walkman uh, law um, comes into play. So just before I go to the mechanical structure, um, I just want you to draw your attention to this blood supply. So the most of the physis is avascular, and the top layers where it matters, it gets uh, the supply, um, capillaries supplied by the physial arteries, and the metaphysial arteries supply this area, and there is one artery or leisure vessel that enters via Jonah uh, Ranbir. So this is important to keep in mind when you do the surgery. So how does this growth plate respond to uh, mechanical forces? Uh, you know, compression, decreases the growth rate, whereas traction increases. And we have made use of this in orthopedics. Also, there is this tendency for the growth plate to right itself. It tends to stay parallel to the joint surface and right angles to the weight bearing line or nearly right angles. And this is a very important factor when we look at the, the remodeling of a uh, myelinated fracture in a child. Even before the metaphyseal uh, or diaphyseal callus starts smoothing out the bump and then starts to overgrow here, the physis starts to right itself. Um, again, we don't know what the controls are, but it happens very consistently unless someone damages either the fracture or the surgeon damages the growth plate. So again, that also comes under uh, Hoyter Folkman's uh, law. So we know how to manipulate it. In a sense, if we apply traction, you all probably know chondrodiatasis, um, a concept uh, popularized by Willis um, Rao and then um, others um, uh, in the Bastiani group, where they pulled across the growth cartilage and it starts to form bone. And the compression, uh, you know, we'll hear more about it. Compression suppresses the growth. Uh, and that's where we, we manipulate the growth by using compression and modulate. Uh, is growth and correct angular and length discrepancies. But if you if you are so intended, you can ablate the whole thing and it will arrest the growth. So there are some semantics in this. I think epiphysiolysis is a wrong word anatomically because we are not doing anything to the epiphysis. We are just clamping the physis. So it should be physiodesis. And then the Greek meaning of desis or desis means a definitive fusion. So you cannot really call it temporary physiodesis or physiodesis. So hence, the guided growth uh, has um, come into our language. So it's technically a temporary physiodesis. Um, probably a better word. And I'm sure Mr. Duranayagam will touch on this history, but remember it started well, you know, early part of the 20th century, 1933 was the first um, proper procedure, although there was some experimental evidence of this, Femister really used it in clinical um, 
um, sort of scenario. And it would be interesting to know that the first pyocytosis was a distal radius and not distal femur. Um, and then, of course, Blount brought the instrumentation, and then on, then lots of things have taken off. So there are several methods, and I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, and uh, the green box uh, is around the, the age plate, and that will be the focus of discussion today. So, you know, preoperative planning is as important as doing the surgery, and uh, there's no shortcut to taking thorough history and assessment. And this is where it's important to differentiate between physiological and blounts, for example. You know, um, and the advice is generally, if you're in the borderline, let's say a child of two and a half years, you can wait if it's physiological virus that will remodel the blounts. You might let get a little bit worse. So I generally don't touch them before they're three years of age to differentiate between these two, because physiological virus is a counterindication for growth, um, um, guided growth. In metabolic conditions, um, particularly dietary rickets, and even in resistant rickets, one has to control or reverse the metabolic disorder before launching into any surgery. Sometimes they just respond and, and, and do very well. And if, if we're dealing with a physial tether on one side, we need to be very careful because this guided growth depends upon the potential of other physis to grow. So if you don't have a growth potential in that, then you're unlikely to get the results. There are indications for doing it in physical tether, but one has to be clear that you're only doing to stop um, the deformity getting worse and you have to supplement it with an osteotomy. And this concept of sick physis is important. Some physis do not behave normally in the sense they don't go according to the predicted growth pattern. And this is called, called sick physis. And how do you recognize that? They're generally seen in syndromes. And if there is a two year difference between bone age and calendar age or chronological age, then one should be aware of it. Still, it's not a contraindication for surgery, but one should be very much aware and um, caution or alert the parents about it. And of course, you know, if you're planning any surgery, if you know the natural history of a particular condition, you can plan it properly. And I refer you to Shapiro's you know, five patterns of, of um, how the growth, um, follows after an injury or paralytic um, effect. So this is just to remind all of us to say, you know, rapid growth around the knee and the wrist, and there's one centimeter per year, per year in distal femur, 0.6 millimeters uh, per annum uh, at proximal tibia, and boys stop growing at 14 and girls at 16. And this is incorporated into many calculations. So while uh, we are, uh, assessing um, uh, the children for, for angular deformity correction. It's important to get, not only examine them clinically, document the deformity, and then get proper action. As you can see here, you can make the valgus deformity disappear. And if you look at the, the tibial segment picture, you're literally looking at the lateral view. The fibula is superimposed on tibia. But when you line them up under supervision, you suddenly unmask the deformity. So it's very important that you you do all this before making any decision. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this mechanical axis and all those um, LDFA and MPTA, but it is not possible in children to measure it that clearly. So, you know, this is promoted by uh, Dr. Stevens, and this is a sort of, you know, a zone concept. You know, valgus is given plus uh, notation and virus Finest notation. And uh, as you can see on the right, those virus and valgus are in zone three. Anything beyond zone three might consider as zone three. So a lot is, to, you know, there's a lot of discussion about bone age, growth remaining, and predicted growth. Fortunately, guided growth doesn't need that critical analysis unless you're dealing with a definitive method or if you're working very close to the uh, maturity, where if you are particularly planning to get a centimeter or two from physiodesis, you need to know how long the bone is going to grow from that point onwards and what you're going to get at the end of that. So there are many methods and the, it's the most imprecise science, uh, the bone age business. That's why it's recommended that if you're really serious about it, use two methods so that you reduce the error of calculation. Either you can risk 
And again, you have to balance it again as taking repeated x-rays, you know, so do no harm. Um, and also, you know, which method do you use? Anderson growth remaining chart is a good one uh, because it's clinically based. You measure leg lengths and you plot it on the chart and that gives you a percentile of growth for that child and then you can preserve it to the skeletal maturity. So it's, it's a clinical method. Mostly took the same data and created a straight line graph. So we can use multiple measurements throughout the journey, let's say six monthly intervals and have a better understanding. And it's more intuitive as you see the straight line progressing in one direction, the affected leg going in other direction and then we can work out where to arrest the growth. But these are considerations for if you're doing a permanent procedure. The arithmetic, arithmetic method is the most commonly frequently used and that depends upon the assumption that the physis is not as physis and growing normally and there's no tether. And it's an artificial cutoff point that boys stop growing at 14 and girls at 16, but it's a very consistently accurate method. And then the, for those who, are, who have computer programs, a multiplier method is incorporated into trauma CAD, and that also gives you an instant um, sort of answer depending upon the leg lengths of good and affected leg. So roughly the indications are any deformity in any plane, and I'm sure Mr. Nyagam would go through this and show some examples, and age, you know, um, any age, but generally, you know, avoid physiological variation age. Um, and we are pushing the boundary. Earlier, when I was in training, we used to say at least two years of growth remaining. Then it became one year. Now it is six months because we know whatever you could get out of it is good. And there is no relation to body weight. You know, even the blonde big babies or big boys can have uh, girls and boys can have it. Of course, there are limitations whether they would really get as much correction as one would expect. And any accessible physis, you know, starting from um, you know, distal femur, tibia, ankle, wrist, etc. And a sick physis, or if you don't know the behavior of the physis, except when you're dealing with physial tether, it is worth giving it a go. And this is a, a good um, sort of base uh, line we need to understand. This is a fantastic study by Bowen et al. published in 1985. And they worked out that you can get seven degrees um, uh, of correction from distal femur and five degrees from pro proximal tibia per 12 months or one year. And other studies have also uh, proven it. But one has to prepare the families that this is what it is, but sometimes they behave unpredictably. So if so far as you respect the periosteum and do not damage the blood supply and do not take the drill to the, the top three layers, it is a very predictable um, sort of um, procedure where it is reversible. Once you take out the implant you use, it's, it's, it's reversible. And a lot is said about um, uh, rebound phenomena and we'll probably see a case at the end of this um, uh, webinar towards as we go into case presentations. And it is just tells you how resilient this growth plate is. So you take it out, it just carries on. It's a projection of normal physical growth. So what? Be aware. And if it starts to become deformed, if the limbs start to become deformed, you can repeat the procedure. And that's why close follow-up is very important uh, as throughout the procedure monitoring and post-procedure monitoring. And again, we will probably have some discussion around how much overcorrection do you consider and how do you really plan it or incorporate into your treatment plan. So to conclude, growth plate is a very complex and beautiful organ in growing skeleton and we only have a better understanding of mechanical, mechanical behavior and nothing else about it but we can make use of that in, in treating children. And of course it is amenable to manipulation. You can almost switch on, switch off the growth during a certain period of uh, skeletal growth. And I'm sure temporary versus permanent, which is the best, the debate will go on. And generally, most of us find that it's a very successful uh, technique, but should be, uh, should, we should have the same uh, rigorous follow-up uh, as we do for many other conditions. 
Okay, so you know, take the parents on board like in any pediatric condition, and this is no different. Thanks, Emad. I'll, I'll stop here. Okay. Mike? Yeah, Durai will uh, go next, and then we'll do the question answer session. Okay, I wonder if you can see my screen now. Yeah, yeah, Good. here we can. Okay, do. so um, to follow on from Om Lahoti's basic science presentation about the growth plate, I'm going to take you along some of the clinical aspects about guided growth. And to answer the question, what guided growth is, it is simply a method by which you create differential growth across a physis. By creating differential growth across a physis, you thereby produce one side of the growth plate growing at a different rate to the other, and in so doing, produce an angular phenomena, which if used in the place of deformity, will produce correction. Now, it is the techniques that we use today are techniques that can be reversible, and hence we sometimes use the phrase temporary hemiepiphysiodesis. Now we can use several different implants to achieve this effect. You've heard about uh, Blount being one of the pioneers of this method, and we'll talk about the eight plate, which is currently the most common method of uh, guided growth. And I'll also mention a little bit about using transfacial screws. Whilst uh, Femister used a bone block, a reverse bone block to achieve uh, guided growth, what we want to talk about today is really about reversible guided growth. And the pioneer of this method uh, is none other than Walter Blount. And this paper published in 1949 in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery is really the culmination uh, of uh, his basic science research. And this was the first clinical paper using staples. Now, to understand his technique, it was effectively producing uh, a tether on one side of the physis using metallic implants, in his case, staples. And this was done through an oblique incision uh, that allowed you access to the physis without damaging the perichondrial ring, as you've heard earlier, or the periosteum, and inserting these staples equidistant from the physis, but using multiple staples on one side so that you could be assured that the physial tether would be created across that side of the physis. Now, since Blount's method was popularized, another technique was introduced, and that by Peter Stevens using uh, the eight blade. The eight plate is a tension band device. Uh, as we heard, the physis uh, increases longitudinal growth by the sequential addition of cells, and subsequently these column of cells become columns of bone uh, through the nature of growth. If you were to uh, apply a device to across the physis on one side, you are in effect trying to convert that tension force, that separation, into a compressive force. And we know in orthopedic biomechanics, when you try and convert a tensile force into a compressive force, that device functions as a tension band. And so in fact, the eight plate is a tension band. The fulcrum of an eight plate, when the screws are parallel, is infinity. And as the eight plate gradually exerts its effect, the screws start to diverge. And that fulcrum goes from infinity and comes closer and closer to the plate. There can be points in which you will see the screws diverge maximally, and that is not the end of the effect of the eight plate, because 
the eight plate has been designed by the manner of its eight shape to be narrow in the middle. So when the screws reach maximum divergence, the weak point of the plate, the middle, starts to bend. And so it continues its effect even after the screws reach maximum divergence. So whilst it looks quite simple, it's actually a very clever device. Now the learning curve of inserting an eight plate is, according to Peter Stevens, one case. And I, this is in fact true. For those of you who have not used this technique, I will show you a few slides uh, on use of the eight plate. So here you have the position of the patient, which is supine with the patella facing upwards. It's important that you can get clear anteroposterior and lateral uh, C-arm views of the area that you're working on. You start by marking the physeal level uh, using the CR. And this can be done uh, on both in this case, in this example, on the femur and on the tibia, but you also need to ensure that you mark the physeal level in the center in the AP or sagittal plane, so that you have center both in the AP view and center in the lateral view. It's a small incision through fascia, but once you go deep to fascia and start to retract muscle, it's very important that you preserve the periosteum and the perichondral ring. So unlike classic orthopedic operations, you don't cut straight down to bone and start to scrape the periosteum of bone. That is a contraindication to using this technique. It's a no-no keep the periosteum and the perichondral ring intact. Once you have reached that layer, using self-retainers or an assistant to retract the skin edges, you can then position the eight plate over the physis and accurately center the eight plate by using a uh, half pin, that, sorry, by using a needle that needle is inserted through the center hole of the eight plate and using the c-arm you can ensure that that eight plate is directly over the physis here you can see the needle being inserted into the physis a small green needle will not cause permanent damage to the physis this assures you that that eight plate will be central across that physis Following the centralization of the eight plate, you then use guide pins to be inserted across the holes of the eight plate. These guide pins ideally should be parallel to each other, but it is not essential. Such is the latitude for flexibility with the eight plate that even if the guide pins are not parallel, the eight plate will work. After insertion of these guide pins, you drill over these guide wires with a cannulated drill. And my advice would be just to drill the outer cortex to a depth of a centimeter, because the screws being inserted into Cancellus bone will insert quite easily. So here is an image of the device being implanted. As I said, the learning curve for this procedure is one case. And here you have both one in the femur and one in the tibia. And this is what the x-ray should look like following the procedure. The commonest indication for using guided growth is deformities around the knee and usually coronal plane deformities. So here are examples. Here in this case, a bilateral genu valgum treated successfully with medial, uh, medially applied eight plates to the femur and the tibia. As to which bone you should apply the eight plate to, you can get some guidance by measuring the reference angles that uh, Om Lahoti mentioned earlier. If the principal deformity is arising from the femur, use an eight plate on the femur. If it's arising from both, then both. 
always apply the eight plate on the convex side of the deformity because that is the side you want to slow the growth from. And always check before you offer eight plate as a method of correction of deformity that the physis is working. And this is uh, what the previous speaker has alluded to. If you have a sick physis or if the deformity has arisen because of a physial bar, a growth arrest, in which case the eight plate will not succeed in correcting the deformity. Here is an example of a, a genuverum. This is in a hypophosphatemic rickets, also successfully corrected using eight plates. The key questions that most people want answering when they're starting to use guided growth is, uh, what is the optimum age to use this technique? How fast can I correct the deformity? And how long can I leave the implant in place before I start to worry about permanent effects of creating a tether? And what happens after I remove the device? As you would expect, this is guided growth. The speed of correction is directly proportional to the speed of growth the child. So quite simply, if you look at the growth charts of boys and girls, you will see that the exponential part of the curve in both boys and girls tend to occur after the age of eight years. So quite simply, if you want to achieve a fast rate of correction and you have time to plan for that correction, then waiting to around the age of eight will give you the fastest correction. Sometimes you may need to use the technique at an age younger than eight. Because the technique is reversible, it is perfectly reasonable to consider it. But if you were planning a time and you didn't have to use it in the child younger than the age of eight, then wait until then, because you will achieve the fastest rate of correction around that age. What happens to the rate of growth after you insert the implants and what happens after removal? Well, this answer was actually obtained by Walter Blount himself some 20 years after he introduced the technique. He followed his patients and recorded the effect of the staples on the rate of growth. And he found that about 50% of the rate of growth was retarded in the first six months, and this increased to 80% after that period. What happens after removal? Well, we've already heard both the staple and the eight plate technique is a reversible technique. We published from Liverpool our first experience in 25 patients, but we have now done over 250 patients since 2005, the majority being for deformities around the knee joint, genuverum and genuvalgum. And what we found that the rate of correction is about 0.7 of a degree in the femur per month, 0.5 of a degree in the femur, uh, sorry, in the tibia per month, and if you were to uh, use guided growth in both, it adds up summatively to 1.2 degrees per month. Understandably, children under the age of 10 seem to correct much faster. The advice given by Peter Stevens is you should not leave the eight plate much more than two and a half to three years, simply because there is a potential risk when it's left in for too long to create a permanent tether. Certainly in our experience in Liverpool, we've had eight plates in for three years and removed them after three years without a permanent tether. If you have a very large deformity to treat that would take more than three years to correct, then consider either starting earlier or during the rapid phase of growth around the age of eight years, or performing part of the correction, and when you reach two and a half to three years, removing one screw, giving a rest period of a year, and then reinserting the screw to continue the correction. There are some 
conditions which reliably produce a rebound deformity. And in these conditions, you need to consider overcorrection. The two that count to mind are cosins. For those of you who need reminding, cosins is a tibial valgus that arises from proximal tibial fractures. It doesn't appear to be a direct injury to the physis, but it's an effect on the physis that seems to produce a valgus deformity. And that, if you were to use eight plates to correct, requires overcorrection prior to removal of the eight plate. The same happens with blounds. When does guided growth not work? Well, you've heard sick physis, or when you have identified a tether in the physis, then it is not possible for the other side of the physis to grow differentially in compared to the side that has the implant on. So here is a case of blounds, bilateral blounds, and you can see that on the left leg, we've achieved correction with the eight plate. But on the right side, despite the fact that the screws have diverged fully, we have not achieved any correction. So on this right side, there must have been an occult tether. Just a short note about Jean-Paul Metizot's technique, which was uh, described in 1998. And these are percutaneous, epiphyseal or transphyseal screws, and, or PETs for short. You can see that he described different patterns of using the screws, either crossed, non-intersecting, or using them on one side to achieve guided growth. I want to, uh, there are several papers, clinical papers, non-originator uh, uh, papers on this technique that suggest some concern. Uh, this one published in the Journal in Bone and Joint Surgery suggests only two thirds achieve growth modulation and about one fifth of the cases continue to develop further deformity suggesting a permanent arrest. And it's nothing to say that the technique is bad, but just compare uh, the Blount staple and the Stevens eight plate and the Metizo screw. The first two achieve growth modulation or rather guided growth by modulating the physis, by providing a compressive force around the edge of the physis. Whereas the Metizo screw achieves guided growth by producing a point of arrest in the physis. And if you were to look at the three-dimensional uh, shape of the physis, that screw is going to cross the physis at one part. And that part can be closer towards the center of the joint, further away, more anterior and more posterior. So the location of this screw bar, this physial screw bar, can be critical in whether it succeeds or whether it goes on to create a deformity. So to conclude, I will give you a summary. Most of the indications for use of guided growth is around the knee, and usually for coronal plane deformities. Uh, if you were to choose a time and you have the luxury for choosing a time, then after the age of eight years will allow you to harvest that rapid phase of growth. But if you need to use it in younger children, you can. Ensure that the physis is working before use. And also, if you have to leave the implant longer than three years, consider rest periods in between. And I will leave you with perhaps the most important pearl, which was uh, given to us by Walter Blau. Do not use this method of treatment in a patient who cannot be followed up. Simply, these patients have to be reliable to return four monthly to have regular clinical and x-ray checks to ensure the point of removal of the implant is judged well. If you have a patient who is lost to follow up, and I have had those, they will come to you with reverse deformities. Thank you. I will stop the share of the screen now and pass you back to the moderator. Right, okay. So um, there are uh, some questions. So one is that uh, the, the direct um, uh, to you is that, is there any reason why you use a needle in the central hole of the eight plate rather than the K wire? Um, is my audio still, yes, my audio is still on. The answer is it's a much smaller 
injury to the eight plate. The K wire is a 1.6 millimeter and I think the, the, the needle is probably less than a third the diameter of the K wire. Okay, so it's, it's, it's principally because of the injury. Is, is there any reason you will, um, any time you'll use the K wire uh, or it's always because it's an oblique uh, physis and do you, uh, are you always successful in using the K wire because sometimes it can be a bit hard to go in or so uh, you, in fact, the, the needle is actually, I'll be talking about the needle in the central hole of the eight plate, not the, not the KYs through the actual holes of the eight plate, right? The central hole, well, the needle, first of all, uh, is not threaded, it's sharp, it's smooth. Secondly, uh, the hole in the center of the eight plate uh, is obviously much smaller than the holes of the actual eight plate itself. And you have this feedback when you insert it into the physis. If you are not in the physis, you will find resistance because you're either too proximal or too distal. So in addition to using uh, x-ray, you also have uh, the feedback of the needle inserting. This is particularly useful in older children when the physis is getting narrower. Obviously in a young child, when the physis is wide, it's not usually a problem. Okay. Uh, one of the questions is that, uh, probably to both of you, is that uh, have you used or is it advisable to use uh, guided growth in fibular hemimelia? So uh, I do use guided growth for the distal femoral valgus in fibular hemimelia, and it is a very successful technique. And I saw one of the questions, you do not need to overcorrect in that. Uh, however, I will say, that I will tend to time my distal femoral correction later in those children, probably around the age of 10 to 12 years of age. Right. Um, and actually, I, I don't know whether this is answerable. One of our, uh, one of our trainees who was a consultant here now moved back to Pakistan. He has asked, he can't get hold of the plate. Any chance? Uh, Better to use a staple or, or can I make one? Right. Uh, Peter Stevens is very uh, charitable. When he lectures overseas, he says, use a cut recon plate. Okay. So uh, just get your standard trauma recon plate, cut it to two holes and use that. Right. Okay. Now, just w one more question is that, is there at any point either of the, uh, faculty has used it for correction of the rotation. That's a very good question. Um, you know, Hammond, um, there, there are, uh, uh, may I answer first and then pass it to, to okay. O? When you have a device that works so well, and I would say the eight plate is one of them, we start to explore extended indications. And in the case discussions, we're going to show some. But there's a danger. The danger is, and I will use the example of uh, intramedullary nailing in the tibia. When people get good at intramedullary nailing in the tibia, they'll try and use it for every fracture of the tibia. And, and simply with rotation, I think there are better ways to treat rotation. Uh, okay. Just like in other conditions, you just have to choose the right technique for the right problem. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's an interesting question. Quite often asked at these forums. You know, Peter Stevens says in his paper, and you haven't heard him, I know you heard him. So he says rotational alignment or model alignment is not as detrimental to the joint loading, and you know the the, the problem with the valgus varus causing, you know, asymmetric joint loading. So he says that that need and be really corrected using this technique, focus on the angular correction. And that's much better answer, um, much better way of dealing with, but I'm sure there are people, as, as the Ryan Igam said, use it for everything. Okay. I have no personal experience. I don't even, you know, sort of go into that area. Yeah. Okay, just one more question is, before we move on to cases, is that, uh, what about the distal tibia? 
especially the valgus of the ankle. Um, there is some controversy. Some people say it doesn't work very well, and some say um, don't use it. What is your experience? Oh, yeah. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm. You know, I haven't done that many, but um, I take this view that if you haven't um, got any correction, you haven't done any damage. Okay. But so far, I could count the number, maybe five or six. And very good, you know, like it, it, it just reduced it. And some of them were very good, you know, particularly aphysial displa um, dysplasia and the multiple osteochondromatosis. Uh, very happy. And the ones which didn't correct that much, there was very little, a very small correction that needed with a wedge um, osteotomy, for example, a wedge, um, putting wedge or closing wedge. But if I go back and see before physial screw, that would have been a big wedge taking out. So there is a definite, I will definitely do it, um, but my experience is very small. So uh, with the distal tibial valgus, there are two likely scenarios you have where you might want to use it. One of them, is because there is a deformity in the distal tibia and the physis is open, then I would consider using an eight plate on the medial side to try and correct it. Another reason uh, where you have a distal valgus is the fibula is too short. The actual plafond is actually perpendicular to the tibial axis, but the fibula is too short. And so the whole ankle goes into valgus. And in those cases, I would choose if the child is young enough to perform uh, isolated fibular lengthening to control the val valgus and not use an eight plate. So I tried to differentiate uh, between the two. Right, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, can I, um, so I don't know, um, it, it really doesn't matter who wants to go first, but uh, shall we move on to case presentations? Then? Home, if you want to go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you some rest. Okay, now let me just see. Where is my screen? Just let me. Okay, this is a case where um, I used it for um, just that is not show. Just uh, um, can you see it? Um, share. Can you see my presentation, Mike? Guys, can you see my presentation? Uh, well, could you see it now? No, okay, well, thank you then. So this is a case of Janu Valgum. Um, just illustrates all the issues we talked about. Um, that's so that's, a, it's a child of Ellis von Kreveld or von Kreveld syndrome. For those who, I mean, I didn't know until I saw the child and I looked up, uh, it's a genetic disorder. They generally have cardiac anomalies and cleft palate, requiring, mostly requiring a lot of surgery. And they presented to me with genovalgum. Um, the child was just one year of age, or just under one year, and presented with this uh, deformity. So that's the genovalgum, I mean, with just barely one year. So you know this is not physiological, this is definitely pathological. And you can see here on x-ray, uh, the lateral part of the tibial voice is, um, uh, is not visible. So it's so-called reverse blount, um, if, you, if you explore this further. And then I had, when the child was slightly older, we had an uh, MRI scan and it showed no tether on this side, but hypoplastic uh, uh, lateral tibial condyle. So here is, is a case where you can go in early. Um, you, know, you don't have to wait uh, for uh, any of those um, sort of growth spurts, etc. Uh, this is already significant, uh, you know, the valgus plus three zone or even beyond three. So I said, um, uh, you know, we will offer the child um, a uh, medial uh, age plates. So because the, the physis is very small and you want to really not to miss it, you don't want to end up uh, entering anywhere else, so I just check, modify the technique slightly briefly. Um, so here is a plate, but I'll show you what I did. Um, 
sometimes doing an orthogram is useful to have a good outline, but the principle is that I first put my wire in that position, the center of the epiphysis, so that I know I'm not going to miss it. Then I thread my eight plate, and then I get the metaphyseal wire. I'm not entirely sure whether we should rest exactly in the center of these two. Uh, they, they work uh, even when the, the, the hole is not exactly again as the, the physis. This is a very forgiving technique. But, you know, if you do this, for example, if you put a needle and put eight plate, they come only in two sizes. And it is possible that the top K wire might be just about skirting here. You're not comfortable and you can't, if you insist that it should be centered here, you might run into trouble, particularly in these sort of things. So this is what I did, just contrary to the teaching. I first put the wire in the epiphysis, put the plate over it, and then one wire here, so that held in place. And then I replaced that with a screw, and then that, so that you see the result on the left-hand side. We followed the child up, and then here I erred because it's a very young child, syndromic physis, so-called sick physis. I didn't bother doing any age at that point in time because I knew it would work. So I just overcorrected him into various and took out the plate. Now here is the discussion whether one should use this sleeper um, plate in the sense, take one screw out, and then when it starts to recur come back and insert another screw. But here, the child was going to be you know, much taller and I would miss my target. So I just said, with a 16 millimeter plate, I would probably, you know, my screw there, and if I took out the distal screw, and as the child grew, I'll probably end up my distal screw at the physial level. So I couldn't you know, convince myself that a sleeper plate, sleeper plate is where you use, take out one screw and then go back and use um, use it. Use the same plate again by inserting the distal screw if there's a recurrence. So I took out both the plates, and that was a question. Very pleased with it. And gradually, as we were following him, he started to drift, and that was not at all unexpected. And the child had some palate surgery and some cardiac issues. Also, they have hand anomalies, so. Um, he went away to different institutes and then we came back. As I said, yeah, this is drifting. I think again, I repeat the procedure. There is absolutely no harm. Here it has the evidence that the Pisces is nice and healthy. It is growing back and I repeated the procedure. Um, here it is and I, uh, this was easy to do and this is, I'm sure, perfectly centered on the Pisces. A lot easier to do than when he was young. And last for follow-up. So this is, you know, becoming wise after the event and uh, the child was adopted and um, also had multiple operations lined up elsewhere and we lost him for follow-up. And this just case illustrates how important that follow-up is. So here, the child has gone into um, various. So what are the options here? And um, one is to immediately take the plate out and whether, sorry, uh, whether one should, um, you know, go back and do the opposite side. And I, I, I did. Uh, so, yeah. So before doing that, I just wanted to make sure that the physis is open. So I just did uh, x-rays only and the physis line was clearly um, uh, seen. It was here. This is the point where I wanted to do bone age to see whether are we de really dealing with crisis? And it was definitely um, two years difference, but what can you do? You know, that's what it is. So I said, okay, well, let's do the lateral um, physiodesis or growth, or growth modulation on the uh, presumption that I might get some, if not full correction. So that will reduce my you know, degree of correction I, I need to do after skeletal maturity. Um, are, you know, okay, no correction at all. I haven't done a major operation, but I tried, you know. So how to repeat and when to repeat, and these are the considerations, And but this is such a benign procedure. It's, 
easy to repeat and still not burn any bridges. So I did that and that's it. Uh, age 12 years and that's how he looked and that is age 13, absolutely no movement. So although I saw a physical line and I thought the physis was open, but it wasn't behavioral. Is it due to the um, damage or prolonged compression on this side? Possibly that is the case. Or is it the result of a sick physis? I would never know. But if you go back and, and think about it, yeah, three years uh, played in situ. That was the, the time he got lost for follow-up. Probably done the damage. And um, you know, what can you do? It's only a retrospective. So that you become wise. So now there he is, and uh, it's all fully um, fused physis and um, is waiting for corrective osteotomies. So that is my case, Andrew. Yeah, you want to take over? Yeah, the, the, the will do is the case, and then and there's one more question which we'll do after that. Yeah, okay. All right, Dhruva is going ask. Okay, I've got uh, two short cases to share with the, uh, with the attendees. And I'm going to start by showing you a foot deformity. This is a calcaneus foot deformity, which is another form of uh, usually neuromuscular in origin, but sometimes sadly iatrogenic from an over lengthening of the tender Achilles. Uh, and it's quite a difficult deformity to treat. It's much easier to treat equinus than it is to treat calcaneus. Um, the traditional solutions to this kind of deformity are several. Uh, one of them is a proximal sliding osteotomy where you do an osteotomy and you uh, shift the calcaneum, the posterior calcaneum proximally. You also shorten the tendo Achilles and you might want to augment the strength of the tendo Achilles by transferring the tibialis anterior or tibialis posterior to the oscalsis and you often have to do a plantar fascia release. Uh, I've done this procedure. It does make a cosmetic difference, but because of the weakness of the gastroc and the soleus for a long time, having an overlong tender Achilles, it, clinically, it's not very uh, powerful. The Elizaroff version of treating this is to create a block, an arthroeresis, to excessive dorsiflexion. And as you can see in the pictures that I've taken from Elizaroff's book, it's to create a anterior osteotomy of the tibia to bring it down to create a dorsiflexion block. And that is what uh, an arthroeresis is to create a support or a block to joint movement. Now, uh, you can actually use guided growth to create this block to excessive dorsiflexion. This is controlled gradual arthroeresis. So here we have a posterolateral approach to the ankle. You can see I'm using the eight plate in exactly the same way that I use it in the femur and the tibia with the needle through the central hole with an x-ray to check that I'm centered directly over the physis and then to follow on with the guide wires again under x-ray control to make sure that I'm not violating the joint or the physial space. Uh, and you can see here the drill is penetrating only about a centimeter in and I'll let the screw enter completely by itself. And here is the after effect of controlled growth, uh, guided growth arthroresis, creating a dorsiflexion block. And you can see the uh, block to dorsiflexion created by the differential growth in the physis. So this is one of, uh, this case here is really to highlight that you can use uh, the eight plate or use the method of guided growth uh, for extended indications. And one of them is sagittal plane deformities of the ankle, and it can also be used in the distal femur. On the point of the distal femur, and uh, I will come to next, because the next uh, extended indication of uh, using the eight plate is if you can use one eight plate on one side, what happens if you use two eight plates on both sides of the growth plate? 
will you achieve, rather than a hemi-epiphysiodesis, will you get a total epiphysiodesis, but temporary? And can we use this for leg length discrepancy, or can we use this even for stature modification? Someone who's going to be far too tall, and you want to reduce uh, their, their height potential. So here is a case example that I can show you of someone who has a congenital short femur that after the first lengthening has opted to have the remainder uh, equalized by epiphysiodesis. And in this um, case, we chose to use the technique of temporary epiphysiodesis by eight plate. Now, it can be a useful technique, but I want to use these case examples to share with you some of the difficulties of using this technique. First of all, I would only use this over uh, the drill method, which is the canali method of creating a permanent epiphysiodesis, when I have problems in estimating the age at which to do the epiphysiodesis. So a good example would be when you see the bone age and the chronological age, the natural age, very different, two, three years difference and deciding when to time the epiphysiodesis so as not to leave the child with either to, uh, re continued leg length discrepancy or a reversal of the leg length discrepancy. In those cases, I would consider temporary epiphysiodesis. But what are the caveats? You can quite easily, if you don't pay attention to the technique, create deformities. And there are two types of deformities that can occur. The first is this so-called volcano type deformity of the central tibial spines, and the second is a femoral recurvatum. So this is one of my own cases. You can see here, this is the child before uh, the epiphysiodesis. And what you can see after the epiphysiodesis is completed is you get this uh, so-called prominence of the tibial spines creating uh, so-called volcano deformity. And this paper that was published from Israel in 2018 suggests that uh, it is a deformity. But interestingly enough, this paper only describes the radiological deformity. I think that this deformity is a radiological phenomena because, understandably, you have created a growth tether on both sides of the physis, and the central part of the physis continues to grow. And that is why you get this relative uh, prominence. But I do not think this deformity is clinically relevant. They do not have a restriction of joint movement or an instability arising from this. The other deformity, which is much more common and much more uh, clinically uh, significant is femoral recurvatum. And I myself have made this mistake. And how did I make this mistake? Uh, the reason is you often think that you have to place the eight plate in the center of the femur. And that yellow line that you see is the mid femoral axis. However, the mid femoral axis is not the middle of the width of the physis. The width of the physis in the lateral view is more posterior. The center of the physis is more posterior. So if you were to place the eight plates along the mid femoral uh, uh, physis, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, I'll say that again. If you were to place the eight plate around the mid femoral axis, those eight plates will be actually anterior to the middle of the physis and thereby encourage more growth from the posterior physis than the anterior physis, and you'll get a recurvatum deformity. So here is one of my examples, recurvatum deformity. Here is one of my correct applications of bilateral eight plates for controlling growth of length. That is the width of the physis. That is the mid femoral axis. And that is the mid physial axis. So when you take your lateral view of the femur, take care to make sure that you position these eight plates in the middle 
of the physis, not the middle of the bone. So just to conclude with these uh, two cases that I've shown you, that you, even though the commonest indication uh, for guided growth is usually in the coronal plane in the knee joint, you, there are some extended indications and I've shown one in the sagittal plane in the ankle. And I've also showed you an examples of using it for controlling uh, leg length in some cases. Thank you. I've passed the screen back to, yeah. to you, haven't? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just to, so first of all, thank you so much to uh, Dura Naigam and Om Lahati to take the time and uh, um, giving such a such wonderful lecture and and showing some some great cases. There are a couple more questions, but I think we are, have run out of time, so we'll have to uh, just abandon them. Just to remind the del the delegates about our second webinar, which is on the twelfth of August about uh, deformity correction and lengthening nails. Again, it's at UK 3 p.m. So we hope to cover from Brazil to China uh, for people to register and uh, uh, be a reasonable time for all of them. And again, uh, reminder of next year's deformity course. And we look forward to see you soon. And thank you very much for joining. Take care, bye. Thank you.